we know how you want it to be. Welcome to the grounds for sculpture. Bigger than you think. You want to go back to New Jersey, but sometimes New Jersey's not as big as you think. The city is not like a garden, and if you give it time, it'll grow. The ocean's only seven hours. In this episode, we will go beyond the doors of the Motors Building. We have been invited into the Yuri Polishy studio. The series is now going deeper. We're going to be following Yuri as he goes through the process of making a moment. Thank you. Host, Rich Barnes. Hold on. See today your own. Okay. We know exactly what you want, but sometimes what you have is more than you think. Yuri will take us through the process of creating a mold for his portrait of Isaac Whitkin. Yuri's in the final stages of finishing his portrait of his friend Isaac Witkin, who passed away. I had the pleasure of recording an interview with Mr. Witkin in the Les Jardins des Artistes series. We know how you want it to be, but sometimes these things are bigger than you think. You want to go back to New Jersey, but sometimes New Jersey's not as big as you think. The city is like a garden, and if you give it time, it'll grow. The ocean's only seven hours wide, so sometimes these things are smaller than you think. Actually born in South Africa, um, lived in England for nine years, immigrated there, and then immigrated to this country in 1965, where I had a job offering at Bennington College in Vermont, and have been here ever since. And what do you <coughs> like about America and your ability to express your artistic side? Well, what I like about it, it's a very unstratified society like Europe. And um, <clears throat> people take you at the value that you place on yourself. And it's possible to achieve whatever your dream is uh, without um, any kind of prejudice, according to race, background, education, and so on. It's just possible. The American dream is possible. It was for me. Tell us about your <clears throat> apprenticeship and work with Henry Moore. Well, there was a wonderful period in my life. I had gone through three years of art school, and uh, I wrote to Henry Moore and asked him for a job. And uh, a year later, I got a reply saying, sure. He had, he had seen photographs of my work and uh, had liked them, invited me up to much had him, Perry Green in Hertfordshire, where he lived and worked. And we had an interview, and um, he said, if you can find something else in the meantime, don't stop your life. But um, keep in touch, and uh, I'll write to you when I, need, when I have an opening. And sure enough, he did. You have a famous sculpture. You have quite a few famous sculptures on the grounds. What can you tell us about Garden State? Uh, well, it's a sort of an interesting story, because... Uh, it was around about 1995, 96, where a patron collector by the name of Philip Berman 
uh, had a, uh, a, a collection of sculpture, of stone sculptures, which Brookberry. I'm Yuri Holoshi, sculptor, and I'm working on Isaac Witkin at this point. Um, I'm developing this particular piece for a, a major composition, which is to come down the line later. The, uh, the piece that I'm working here right now and doing is uh, doing a mold of Isaac. There's a couple of things that I want to do. I have also specific approaches in how I sort of deal with doing a portrait. Um, the actual mission that I'm going to try to accomplish with this piece is going to be very similar to what I have done with the portrait of my father back here. And in this particular case, the actual portrait <coughs> really sits on a post. And what I do by having the portrait seated, I can maneuver it, I can change the position to the character that I want the piece to have. So that's going to be my main mission for Isaac's portrait, the basic portrait. Now there's a couple of things I'm going to be doing with this portrait. I'll be doing some smaller molds. And the smaller molds will consist basically areas that I have kept deep within these particular sections. I really like to have sort of very strong contrasting areas. And so I've made an uh, area in through here where the ears are, the, the fold of the hair, and again, back in here. Underneath here is the fully developed ear. So I want to bring that out in the actual piece itself. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, so what we're going to do is make little sub-molds. Then once I said I complete the sub-mold, I'm going to cut that section out. And then I'm going to go ahead and then make the major mold after that. need this catalyst until it becomes evenly pink. Okay, what is it that you're using now? This is called the uh, Pojo Putty. It's a hand mold catalyst. This is a... Uh, so basically all the, the... everything is built within that Putty, that you just have to work that's, it then. That's correct. I just have to model it, work it together. It break it loose and get the catalyst together. And then once it's set, and I just. Uh, this little stuff. This. It shouldn't, shouldn't be too bad. Seems to be something on my end of my glove here that wants to stick on. Okay. because that's, that's how far I need to go in oh, to the so piece. That's a reference, that's a reference for me. Otherwise, I'd be putting all over the place. And now I just go right up to that area because this is what I'm really going to be pulling out, pulling off the ear. And once the rubber is hardened, then I'm going to and have a backup, a plaster backup on it. And then I will pull that clay off. And maybe I'm actually maybe even able to pull the clay off without having the plaster to begin. I don't think I'm going to make this rubber. I want to push very consistently into it.
And then when I make the actual casting, these will all be casted individually and then adhered onto the surface so that same thing goes for here. Is that an official sculptor's knife that you're using to... This is a, an official knife that is of all purpose for anybody who wants to, you know, do anything. It's the, the thing to have. I have these little cracks, okay, I'm pushing smaller pieces in here to make sure that I get into the depth, otherwise it'll end up as an air pocket. small sections at a time because I want to make sure that I don't deal with any undercuts. I don't want to go too far into there by accident. So I'm calculating. I'm doing a little bit of it here because that's going to be a visual texture, whereas the rest of it I can kind of sort of fade with it a little bit. Feeling the putty getting a little harder in my hand, which is good. Now let's see what we have here. This is going to be a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you're cutting this so that you can check the depth. Correct. How many times do you think you've done this sort of thing before? Oh, I don't know. A whole different molds throughout my lifetime. But I'm not really specifically a mold person per se because only for specific things do I make molds. But for the most part, okay, it's build it directly and they exist without mold, so they're like, you know, just one of a kind type things. I make some fresh batch, more. Again, the more catalyst I put into it, the quicker it uh, hardens. It's already firming up, so I can build up some more. And you can kind of see it resists being pushed around. So I can 
build it up heavier. Now, what is the purpose of using using the backing, the plaster backing, is to keep the rubber in position and shape. Uh, in basic sense, this is sort of like a cup. The rubber is a little bit on the looser side, so by having this, it holds that particular shape together, and it keeps it from moving. Otherwise, you'll have shifting. Now, will you be doing this throughout the entire process where you'll be adding support like that to the entire mold? That is correct, yes. Otherwise, I'll just have those sections that uh, trying to make a print off of that is not going to match up for the rest of the pieces. Uh, the flexibility is really only into the rubber. The, uh, you don't want the mother mold, which is the term that is used for the plaster backing, to move. The mother mold has to be fixed, has to be stationary. The rubber mold inside of it can move and uh, can be sort of readjusted. I'm trying to build up heavy enough that exactly it's not going to move on me because if it's too weak the uh, application then uh, it'll shift or I need the accuracy of that particular shape to fit when I make the entire piece I need to have it firm so basically what I'm what we're making is something like this it has the rubber in it okay and this has the imprint inside of it so that the rubber can easily be pulled out of the shell and then the print can be pulled from the rubber. All right, now we're going to do up front. Try to pat this on it. That's interesting. Now what what is that going to do? That's just to keep the plaster from messing up the clay. Sort of like a bib. Bib? Bib. Because as I'm putting plaster around, I don't want, you know, as you can see, I got a little bit of plaster here on the edges. Mm -hmm. And I was dripping down on this side, that's why I had it here on the shoulder before. So now I'm just kind of putting it over here to make sure that my drips are not going to affect the, the piece itself. So I'm protecting it. That's a surgical process. At the <laughs> Pretty much been a standard uh, method for uh... for making molds. Yes. Yeah, in terms of you know when you're having, I mean the old way used to be doing everything plaster, but your piece molds had sections of plaster that were components, and then you still had to have one major mother mold to hold all your piece molds together. So the rubber kind of takes over the piece sections and simplifies things because with rubber you can come down to you know one rubber shape that goes in and cuts in all your undercuts and everything else and may minimize it to a piece mold might have taken say 
well, let's say six six parts to a piece mold. A rubber mold does it all in one shot. But you still have to have the backup to keep it in position. And the piece mold sections, the, the, the mold was there to keep all the parts together and keep them as like little building blocks in, in one, one shape. This part is done. As you can see, see how the drip marks have been caught by the cloth. So let me remove it. It's still up or something. Okay, not that perfect. <laughs> Now this molding method will be able to pick up all the detail that you put in around the eye and so forth. And That's correct. That's why I want to make sure that I don't have the plaster on it because then it'll also pick up the little, I mean the plaster, you know, will have slightly higher ridges. So I want to make sure all of that is also gone. Isaac will be grateful that you uh, cleaned him up. Yeah, you want to blow your nose, buddy? <laughs> yeah, when it bends like this, these are very critical parts that require a little additional reinforcement. So which parts are the critical parts? Critical is like bends like that, or something of this nature here, which I really kind of build up as well. It goes long, thin, and it doesn't have that much uh, you know, structure. This is simple, basic. And I'll do the rest of the cleaning. Right. Moved this particular piece here and um, realizing that once I had removed it that I could have gone in deeper that the cavity itself as you can see is a lot more deeper so I'm going to actually go in and try to get the rest of it but I'm going to go with it uh, continuing that was with what, what I've already accomplished so I removed the supportive shell around it that's, that's going to be discarded I'm going to go ahead and put this up there, but before I do that, I'm going to just to make sure that I have all of the, the depth. So I've got it from here, and across, and through here, and come down here. The um, reason for my choice in doing this because is that if it gives me the option of being able to be a little bit more air aided with the particular pieces or sections, like for instance the hair, and right now the this is clay so it's somewhat solid, but I may be feeling like, okay, I want to have a little sort of openness or light that might come through the folds of the hair sections as I'm sort of developing it in the final piece. So. I'm going to go ahead and reposition this into its area. Now, would you, have to, would you have to moisten the clay at all to make sure it stays there while you... No, I can I'm just hold it in position in there. I mean, it, it attaches itself, that's enough. The, the rubber doesn't have anything to do with it because the rubber will self-adhere itself to itself. I mean, it won't get attached to anything else, but it'll attached to its own self. I think we've got this thing pretty much on top. And uh, I'm waiting for this part to kind of harden up before I put the plaster on. I'm going to go ahead and cut this part out.
see if I can use up this which I have used here. It doesn't generally work, but it still has moisture in it. Harden it, and then once that is settled, okay. Is this it? Is this it? Do we have? Do we have lift off here, or what? in his head and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Will this clay always stay moist or, or manageable? Manipulative? Yeah, I guess yes, saying. yes. Always. It's an oil-based clay that uh, has the capability of uh, possibly being used. You never have to wet it or do anything to it. on it, take wet cloth, cover it up, and constantly maintain it. Otherwise it dries out. And uh, which you can rejuvenate, I mean once, but then you know it's like your pieces sort of lost. I had one piece that uh, dried out on me one time. It was real, you know, looked good. But the way, because it went through uh, hot and cold situations with the, the, the clay, the process, that when I touched it, it just said, because at that point it was just compacted uh, clay dust and no longer clay or hard clay in itself. But it was really interesting how it just kind of imploded. And then I've had occasions where because it's a wet clay and I used to eat uh, sunflower seeds while I'm working and all of a sudden then I come back and a couple of days later and I'm getting ready to work and here's this plant growing out of his face. <laughs> <laughs> Like you're trying to smooth things out? Yeah, fill up some of these gaps so that because I don't need rubber in there. It's the name of the point. tool you're using. Yeah. That's just a modeling tool. Gouge tool. In the next episode, we will return to the studio of Yuri Polish. It will take us through the next step in the molding process. But sometimes these things are bigger than you think And you want to go back to New Jersey But sometimes New Jersey's not as big as you think The city is large